This episode of the podcast is brought to you by headbed.com.au. Hey everyone, before we jump into today's episode, I have something special to share with you. Back in episode 305, I had the pleasure of interviewing Catherine Randabell, the brilliant mind behind Headbed. The product is revolutionizing hair salons, especially for stroke survivors. The Headbed offers exceptional neck and head support during hair washes, reducing strain and enhancing blood flow. And for stroke survivors, this means a lower risk of arterial damage and less worry about another stroke, ensuring a safer and more enjoyable salon experience. I'm excited to support a product that perfectly aligns with my mission of stroke prevention and safety. During our interview, Catherine explained how the ergonomic design of the headbed prevents neck hyperextension, a common issue that increases stroke risk. With the headbed, you can feel assured and comfortable at the salon knowing that your health is being looked after. If you are a stroke survivor or know someone who is, the headbed is a game changer for your next salon visit. Be sure to check out episode 305 for my interview with Catherine and discover how this product can make a real difference. Now, for our listeners in the United States, visit Headbed USA to get yours today and enjoy peace of mind during your salon visits. I also wanted to remind you about my book about stroke recovery. It's called The Unexpected Way That a Stroke Became the Best Thing That Happened, 10 Tools for Recovery and Personal Transformation. It features inspiring stories from 10 stroke survivors and offers hope for those on the recovery journey. For more details, visit recoveryafterstroke.com slash book or search for my name, Bill Gassiamis, on Amazon. Welcome back to another episode of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. This is episode 313 and my guest today is Dr. Kenneth Monaghan, a physiotherapist and researcher dedicated to developing new treatments for stroke recovery. In this insightful episode, Dr. Monaghan shares his expertise on the importance of education and motivation for stroke survivors and caregivers. We discuss innovative therapies such as mirror therapy and sensory substitution, the power of neuroplasticity and the vital role of positive expectations in recovery. Join us as we explore practical tips and inspiring stories that highlight the journey from rehabilitation to thriving at home. Dr. <laughs> Kenneth Monaghan, welcome to the podcast. Bill, thank you very, very much for, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure, I have to say. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts over the last uh, few months and um, been very impressed with a lot of the guests that you've had on. Uh, very insightful uh, into the whole world of stroke and stroke recovery. Yeah, thank you so much. I... I do like to have a vast range of guests from stroke survivors to people who help out uh, stroke survivors to um, researchers to all sorts of people, doctors, um, therapists. So it's good that you you also reached out because you're in that space of helping stroke survivors and also putting information out there for caregivers. And we're going to talk about your book in a little while, but before we go down that path and chat about that, Tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to be involved in the space that you are and the work that you're doing. So I'm I'm a physiotherapist or a physical therapist uh, for the last 32 years. And I've focused and I suppose specialized in neurology uh, physiotherapy over the last 20, 25. Um, I live in Ireland and I run a research group um, which specializes in new treatments for how to repair your brain after, you know, neurology conditions and stroke being one of them. Um, and I call my research group the Neuroplasticity Research Group. And it's um, a part of the university where I work, uh, Atlantic Technological University in Ireland. And I have to say I have a huge passion for uh, trying to develop new treatments um, that help patients to recover, mostly in their own homes. Um, I've probably about six PhD students that have passed through my books over the last few years and a number of master's research projects. 
And all of those have been involved in developing novel or innovative techniques that uh, help stroke patients in particular uh, to recover. So uh, we're, I'm very much involved in developing new technology. Uh, but but I, I also realized that, you know, from talking to hundreds of caregivers and stroke survivors that I've worked with over the years, that when patients um, go home or when caregivers are uh, bringing their stroke survivors home, most people tend to feel a little bit, you know, devastated and disappointed because they they feel that this is the this is kind of the end of the journey for them and that you know when they're not in a formal rehab setting um that that's really the best chance of their recovery gone but i actually you know from the research that that i've carried out and also from everything that i've read and from everything i've experienced i actually feel that coming home can be a different phase of the recovery and actually your home really has um, unexpected benefits that most people would uh, underestimate. Uh, so that's that's why I wrote the book um, Lights, Mirrors, Action, because I, I felt that maybe a week to two weeks out from somebody being discharged home, uh, they need to, they could benefit from certain information um, that would educate them and give them confidence and the caregiver confidence as well that, you know, when they're going home, not to be thinking as a, a disappointed person, but, you know, looking and planning for that next phase, uh, because that can be very successful as far as I'm concerned. And it's something I've learned over the years. So that's that's probably my background. And since I've started um, since I started writing the book formally about two years ago and I started um, interacting on LinkedIn and that's where I met yourself and where I, I came in contact with your podcast, I have come across so many people that um, feel the same way that there's a need for some information to kind of give people confidence and guidance. Um, and it's been a fantastic journey um, so far. Um, and I have to say, I, I absolutely love it. And uh, hopefully I'll keep going for the next number of years. So thank you for the invite as well. Yeah, you're 100% right. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I faced when I went home was no information whatsoever. Now, it's 12 years since I started down this whole journey of stroke and recovery. And the internet was just sort of coming into its own there wasn't a lot of information online and there certainly wasn't a lot of um books in publication that i could pick up and read there was a few scattered here or there but there wasn't an um, an abundance of them and i remember being at home with my wife and trying to work out what what now you know what do we do now nobody gave us any information when they sent us home they just said go home and don't do anything for the next six weeks until your next appointment. And then every time something happened, because I had a bleed in the brain and the blood clot was still in my brain for quite uh, some years after that, we didn't know what that meant. Like, how does that impact the brain? How does it um, cause challenges? What does it do to, uh, to somebody? So when I, I noticed that I felt weird or strange or different or there was a shift in um the the clot or something i automatically thought well i'm probably having another stroke and what do i do about that and of course i wasn't having a stroke every time but the fear and the concern about it since you have no knowledge whatsoever meant that we ended up in hospital a lot we ended up in hospital at the drop of a hat every time we thought something was wrong you know, we went to the hospital and we wasted resources, which is probably not a waste. It's it's resources, though, that could be allocated to somebody else. Um, we also um, lived in anxiety and probably in fear. And we needed guidance. We needed somebody to tell us how to go about navigating the next six weeks. So we fumbled our way through that. And then six weeks later, I had another bleed. But then that's when things got really serious. So the bleed that was in my brain doubled in size. It was about the size of a golf ball, the clot that formed. Um, and it was the time when I came home where I had no, I had problems with my memory. I couldn't form a sentence properly. I, I couldn't start and finish um, sentences. My thinking was gone. 
I couldn't work. I couldn't write an email. I forgot who come to visit me. There's a whole bunch of problems. And of course, we don't know anything about what that means. We don't know if they're permanent. We don't know if they're temporary. We don't know if it's cause of the clot. We don't know if there's any damage. So we are just guessing and we're doing our best and we're just swimming in this massive ocean of uh, experiences that we've never had before. And we don't know how to navigate it at all. We don't have a map. We don't have anything. So in desperation, you reach out to the internet and you try and, you know, grasp onto some document that you might come across or a little bit of research or whatever. And it is hit and miss a lot of the time. It's hit and miss. You come across something and it's not really relevant and you've spent ages trying to find it and and so on. And one of the reasons the podcast exists is exactly because like you, I wanted to address that same gap. It's what do you do? And honestly, the caregivers that I had, my wife struggled the most because she's the one that's okay. She's the one that has the task to supposedly care for me and look after me and pick up the slack. And she's got no information because before she became a caregiver, she had no idea what, uh, she wasn't trained, you know, doctors and nurses are always in hospital. Um, they're always getting trained. They're always doing extracurricular activities to keep um, ahead of the the research, etc. But the lay person doesn't have any idea. And they're given the biggest task of anybody. And that's to care for a stroke survivor. So I like the way you think. I like that idea of sort of trying to fill that gap and trying to send people home with some information that they could read to guide them about how to navigate that. And I specifically like the fact that you're doing that for caregivers. You have caregivers in mind, understanding that the caregiver, if they get the support and the help, then that ultimately benefits them and the stroke survivor. And then that makes everybody's life a little easier. Um, and stroke survivors can be difficult at times because they've had a stroke and they're dealing with altered neurological um, uh, neurological way of being, you know, they're completely altered. Could be deficits in arms, legs, uh, could be speech deficits, could be eye, eyesight deficits, could be all sorts of deficits. Um, so, so that part, like that part, was the part that intrigued me the most. That you felt that even though you're doing such a, a large amount of work in that space of helping people with their rehabilitation, that even then when you sent them home, you felt that they were ill-equipped. Is is that right? Do you Was it a kind of a sense that you need to equip them more or further or what was it? If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. I think, <clears throat> I suppose, I think that um, in terms of rehabilitation, a lot of people are searching for this golden ticket therapy that is the one thing that's going to get them better after stroke naturally. Everybody's looking for that. And there's probably, from, from what I have read over the years and experienced, there's probably more than 30 different therapies that there's evidence there that are safe, that can be carried out and and sh and claim to, you know, help people to recover physically after a stroke. And each one of those um, is worth trying for for somebody at home. There's no doubt about that. But 
but people have to realize that there's no one brilliant therapy that that will get you better and people also have to realize uh, from my experience that you have to try and become active in your rehabilitation program and become active in your decision making and that's a huge part of it because what i find not just with stroke patients but but people in general that i work with as a physiotherapist or a physical therapist patients tend to have a passive approach to medicine i find and what i mean by that is that and i i i do this myself i found myself in you know i was in with an orthopedic consultant only recently because i have arthritis in my hip and i actually I, even though i know the exercises that you know, should be done for arthritis in my hip. I actually felt almost intimidated to ask the consultant or to tell him a little bit about what I knew in case I insulted him because I kind of, I was just, I was, I, I actually took that passive approach. And I think that this is something that's going to have to change over the coming years where, you know, and I'm interested to, to hear your opinion about this bill, but I think that patients stroke survivors can, should try as many therapies as they possibly can that are safe to do but but when you try them you instinctively know that one feels good for you or it kind of helps you or that's one that kind of you feel is doing something for you and and on the other hand you also know ones that don't work so well so even though my research group is working on a number of different therapies which are quite, which are innovative and the examples would be mirror therapy and the idea of sensory substitution and cross education there's no guarantees that those things will be the ones that you should do but there you know when i was when i was writing the book i i was determined that i wasn't going to overload people so i was going to choose maybe six different therapies um that people could at least start off with and that might, you know, that people might keep going for, you know, four weeks program because and get a taste for those. And and more importantly, what I wanted to do was I wanted to I wanted to tell you through the book that education and kind of information is so important before you even start, because um, I suppose there's there's a fabulous book that I've read I don't know if you've seen it it's it's called the expectation effect and it's by a man called David Robson uh, mm -hmm. Bill and you've probably heard that expression if you think if you think you can or you think you can't then you're usually correct mm -hmm. and that's actually so true in life is that you know if you if you believe that you can do something or you if you believe that something is going to work for you um, then it there's a much much better chance that it will work for you, um, and it's been proven through research that, you know, when doctors explain to patients, uh, what therapies they're going to be doing or what medicine they're taking or what 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 the likelihood is that they will work and how they work and explain that beforehand, so so almost like priming the person before they start their therapy. They tend to do far, far, far superior than if you don't explain that to people. And what I wanted to say to caregivers was that caregivers are overwhelmed when they go home and because they're taking on all these new tasks. Your wife, I'm sure, probably had to start dealing with financial things. She had to do all the tasks around the house. She had to make all the decisions, a lot that you were doing beforehand. Mm. And all I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of take one area off her hands the area of, you know, what should Bill be doing each day? But I wanted to also say to her that, you know, you you actually can be a brilliant person to help him because a big part of that that help is just explaining certain things to him. So explaining to him that there's a thing called neuroplasticity, for example, um, just knowing that like if you're sitting in that hospital bed a week before you go home, if that's explained to you that there's a thing called neuroplasticity and that everything you do and every, you know, can can actually make your brain change and can help you to build new pathways and that neuroplasticity can happen at any stage, no matter how long you've been after a stroke. If that's explained to you in a very easy to understand terms, well, I think that's motivational. I think I think to hear that actually is a very good starting point because now you're starting to think, well, maybe there is, you know, maybe there is things I can do. 
if your wife kind of explains to you a little bit about, you know, uh, how therapies can be done um, how why your home, for example, can have huge, huge advantages that you don't have in a rehabilitation center. And and one of those advantages is that um, and again, another author that I'm very fond of is um, a professor in Trinity College in Dublin, um, Ian Robertson. He's written a fantastic book called The Winner Effect. But what Ian says is that when our in, when we're in our own home environments, um, our bodies potentially produce a little bit more testosterone, which is that hormone that helps us to kind of rebuild ourselves. And and we we get that because the familiarity of being in your own house. Um, I feel that, too, you know, when I'm when I'm in somebody else's house. And I don't know, you know, where the cups go or where the knives are or where the jam is. You know, you feel so uncomfortable out of it. But when you're in your own home and you know everything and, of course, the sights and the sounds and everything that are there, apparently this goes on in our bodies that we wouldn't be aware of. And that gives us a, an actual physiological benefit or advantage that we wouldn't have been aware of. And, and we can harness those things. So if you as a caregiver, your wife as a caregiver kind of says those two things to you before you go home, she said, Bill, look at, I read, you know, I'm, I'm re reading research and when you go home, your home is actually a brilliant place to do um, rehabilitation because of A, B, C and D advantages. And when you go home, you neuroplasticity is the thing that can happen in your brain and you have to realize that then that's going to be more motivational, I think. I, 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 I'm, I suppose I better ask you, do you, you know, would you feel that that's something that, you know, if you go back to those days when you were in that hospital, if somebody kind of explained those things to you in a very simple to understand way, would, would that have been a help? Absolutely, it would have been a help. One of the big challenges is being in hospital and the, mundi and the mundaneity of the whole experience. However, also being grateful that I'm in hospital because I'm being cared for and looked after. But at some point, you know, that all comes to an end and you do want to get home. And I suppose I was keen to go home sooner than I, um, than I was meant to. So I was given a two month, uh, stay, but I went home after four weeks, something like that, about four and a half weeks. And, um, one of the things that motivated me was Christmas being at home for Christmas because, exactly what you said you know i wanted to be home for christmas in my own home with my family uh, the familiarity of that um the whole i didn't want to spend christmas in a hospital um so i put a lot of work in to get home and when you're talking about neuroplasticity because i had almost three years of dealing with multiple bleeds and then brain surgery and then overcoming uh, the deficits after brain surgery, overcoming the fact that I couldn't walk again and use my left side. Um, I did a lot of research and tried to understand what I could do while I was being passive and while I was waiting for everyone to fuss about around me. Um, I understood that um, neuroplasticity was a thing. I must have picked it up from somebody else, but I, I took a deep dive into what neuroplasticity is and how I could use it and harness it. And then I was doing uh, what you mentioned in one part of your book, which is to imagine myself walking again. And while I was sitting there in my bed doing nothing and had plenty of time on my hand, I was imagining myself walking and I would see myself in the rehab room, you know, doing the perfect walk, even though I couldn't do the perfect walk. So that when I got to rehab, I had given myself some additional neurons to, you know, start firing and wiring so that when I did it, it was much more familiar to my, um, my leg, which had the deficits. And then I, I suppose my theory was that I was going to be able to reduce the amount of time that I was going to be needing to learn how to walk again. And then I read your book and in your book, it basically says exactly that. And, you know, it makes me feel, um, it makes me feel, uh, well, not validated, not that I'm looking for validation, but I suppose for lack of a better word, validated that I was on the right path because not only have I thought of that in 2014, you're talking about that to people right now and you're telling them to do that. And I can't remember where I learned that. And I perhaps haven't told as many people as hopefully you're going to get to tell 
when you see them every single day in your practice, as well as from your book. And that's what people need. They need to know that without any additional effort, without any additional cost, without um, going anywhere and spending all that time traveling to and from and organizing a taxi because they can't drive anymore or somebody to drive them, all they have to do is just imagine themselves walking. And if they like meditation or they're curious about meditation, they can roll that into their meditation. They can imagine themselves walking with a quiet background of a track that's just playing, keeping them calm, keeping them grounded and centered and all that kind of stuff and creating the right environment for neuroplasticity to occur. Um, so my wife didn't know about neuroplasticity, neither did I. We had no need to know about it until we were sent home with uh, all of this list of issues that you have to deal with and overcome. And it would have taken, um, it would have taken a, a, a little bit of that weight off of us and it would have made it a lot easier. And I, love a lot, uh, and I know plenty of stroke survivors who I've spoken to who unfortunately, before they get to go home to hospital, they have a terrible interaction with a doctor who will say something ridiculous like, you're probably not going to walk again. And yeah. if, if I have a hate in this whole experience that I've ever had with one of my biggest hates is that doctors still to this day say that and then you guys and loved ones <laughs> and caregivers have to have to undo the potential damage that that might create. It does. I mean, again, back to the book that we talked about, the expectation effect. You know, if your if your expectations are positive, um, positive things will happen because your body responds. Because your your brain is so um, your so your brain is so much like a pharmacy. Um, in chapter six in the book, just to to mention it, I talk about the famous milkshake experiment. I, I think I'm, you're probably familiar with that, um, Bill. I'm but, familiar with the chapter. So before we go into that, get a, grab the copy of your book. Just hold it up to the uh, camera there just so that we can um, show people who are watching on YouTube uh, what the cover of the book looks like. It's called Light Mirrors Action. We'll talk about that title in a minute. But tell me about the milkshake effect chapter six of the book. Uh, yeah, the, the reason I was I was mentioning it is that to me, this is this is a phenomenal thing is that so an experiment was done in Stanford University where, you know, a group of students were given a milkshake and they were told that it was high in calories, uh, so much so that you wouldn't need to take anything for the rest of the day. And the other group of students were given a milkshake low in calories, uh, told that it was low in calories, um, so much so you probably need two or three meals for the rest of the day. And what they were measuring was this uh, hor hunger hormone called ghrelin. And they were interested to see how much of it was produced for the rest of the day. And as you can imagine, what they found was that the people who believed that they were having the high calorie um, milkshake, they produced three times less hunger hormone in their bodies for the rest of the day. Of course, the milkshake was the exact same, which they didn't know, uh, than the people who believed that it was low calorie. Now, that is an astonishing and a phenomenal fact just by itself, because there is no other explanation to explain why that would happen, except that your brain responded physiologically to what it believed psychologically. It's it's a simple. So when you hear that, now you start to realize the potential, you know, how important and how, how um, you know, impactful it can be for people to say positive things to you and people to say that you know you're likely to have um, recoveries or you know to kind of explain how therapies work and why they would work and so that your understanding and your expectation as such um is a positive one and that's that's such a an important message to get across um as you were speaking earlier bill what i was thinking about again with neuroplasticity was that I first encountered, I suppose I really first encountered the idea of neuroplasticity from from who I think is a brilliant, brilliant um, author and, and researcher is Norman Doidge, who has written those, you know, those fabulous books, uh, the one called The Brain That Changes Itself. Mm -hmm. And 
when I got that book, um, whatever number of years ago, uh, that was very much like a light bulb moment for me because, you know, that under simple understanding that our brains are changing every millisecond that we're alive and everything we're doing. So me talking to you now here, watching you, my brain is actually changing in response to that. And um, that's that's such an important message to tell people. Um, because it um it 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 allows you to realize that um this process can kind of go on for longer than than the six to twelve months, which was kind of the myth that people had. Uh, um when I first started thirty years ago as a physical therapist, uh, that was the message that was sent to everybody. and and we were trained this way. We were told that, you know, if a patient got you know between six to twelve months, that was really what the recovery was going to be. So if at 12 months you didn't have a full recovery, well, then you felt then that that was it. That's the end of the line for me. So for somebody then like Norman Deutsch to write a book um, that discusses so many different new technologies and cases and, and mention the word neuroplasticity and explain what that means, that your brain can repair itself. And that that was phenomenal. That that was brilliant. And then what so so our research group um in sly in 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 the university in ireland where i work we i almost use norman's uh, book as a as a template for some of the projects that we were doing because and that's where the idea of sensory substitution came along which we might discuss at some stage um but but what was brilliant as well was that i had been i had been hugely interested in the whole idea of repetitive practice and kind of repetitive hours of work and where i first heard about this or read about this was um an author called malcolm gladwell who wrote a brilliant book called outliers and in that he talked about this uh, principle of the ten thousand hours rule and the ten thousand hours rule was something that was being applied to sport and to business and essentially it said that if you do 10,000 meaningful hours of practice in any area of life then you can become an expert and there's you know Tiger Woods would be an would be an example of doing that in golf uh, some of the chess grandmasters and when I read that and because I was so involved in stroke research at that stage that's that's when I really felt that that principle could be applied to rehabilitation as well. Um, however, the most 10,000 hours are that principle is a lot of hours. So if you're sitting in your home, as you know yourself, no matter what therapy I give you to do that kind of repetitions and things, it's hard to motivate yourself to keep doing that. So an important principle that we mention in the book and you you hopefully you would agree with this is that it's very important to see bits of progress so that you can prove to yourself that you're making making recovery and actually ian robertson in that book i mentioned before the winner effect he again says that when you see a little bit of recovery so for example bill if you could move your arm to here and you use a measuring tape and you know you can move it like two centimeters more and you're measuring that even if it's not the most accurate measurement Every time you see that progress, again, your body responds by producing this extra testosterone. So it's like these little wins help you to be more likely to get more wins in the future, if that makes sense. So yeah. so now you're kind of building up the, the home environment that has the kind of extra testosterone. If you can measure in a very simple way of progress, you get the testosterone. And if you do this repetitive practice, and of course, what was very lucky for me, I suppose, in one way was very close to when I had the book finished, the Irish and the UK and American Stroke Associations came out with new clinical guidelines or they kind of redefined the guidelines. And one of them, uh, well, two of them, one was that they for the first time said that repetitive practice is definitely evidence. You know, there's evidence to say that this is what uh, stroke survivors should be doing or it gives them the best chance of recovery so that was definitely backing up what what i was thinking and what i was talking about and then the second was that stroke survivors if possible should be aiming to do you know between two to three hours of little packages you know of of therapies during the day that they find work for them you know and if it's possible at all and again 
people get tired and of course fatigue is a very big part of um your recovery and it's it, and and that's you know you you have to obviously um juggle with those things but if possible you're aiming to do two to three hours of therapy every day and when i heard this this was this was fantastic for me because this is what i had believed all along or that i had kind of the message that i had been uh, portraying in the book so it was great to have the backup from the professional associations to kind of say that this is really what we're we're looking for I'm um, finding does that similar anecdotes as well like there's people that i've interviewed who do little and have you know small outcomes or they don't have such big results yet um, and they might be doing little because they are still very fatigued and they're still grappling with all of that um, and then there's people who uh, have a stroke and then are running ultra marathons you know so the the spectrum is very vast it's huge and there's so many different versions of recovery in between um, but it is true that with time people will tell us that you know i've interviewed a lot of stroke survivors that are 10 years out and 15 years out and then they'll tell me that they've had gains in the last few years and they didn't expect that it. it was something that just came out of the blue and it just sort of showed them another level of recovery that um kicked in and it was just as a result of going about life as normal um you know doing business as normal which is going about their home doing their tasks um, perhaps you know being a husband or a wife or an employee whatever they were and they just found out that all of a sudden that they had this win and they might not be able to explain it but if you dive dive a bit deeper into it and you ask them what they were doing different or what they were doing the same they might tell you that you know they've always spent five minutes you know um helping their hand to move or you know picking something up and putting it in a different position and um there is no doubt about it that um the neuroplasticity work and research does show that the more you fire off a set of neuro uh, a neuronal pathway towards a task the more likely that that neuronal pathway is going to become uh, embedded in the brain and as a result is going to be there to support that movement and also perhaps bypass the original path for that particular task um, now of course obviously we know that there's stroke survivors who will struggle with some exercises because they might have spasticity in the hand so the hand might not physically open um, to get them a result that they specifically want uh, but we're talking about here in general even if it's not a task like opening the hand perhaps it's walking and walking doesn't look like it did before stroke even if it's moving in an upright position that's hunched over or in a different kind of way than it used to be um, it's still walking and it should be considered a win and i highlighted um, in section three of your book in the table of context chapter nine i highlighted a win is a win and that's exactly we're going full circle now back to that whole idea of no matter um, how little the gain is or the win is it's really important to recognize it and celebrate it and make a note of it and refer back to it every once in a while and mark it as a point of uh, a, a, a place that you've arrived so that you can go back and see in 12 months how far you've gone and one of the things that i've said previously to caregivers is that it's a good idea to record uh, their loved ones or their patients or whomever and then in, at the six month mark show them the progress because there will definitely have been progress in some way shape or form and it's really important to be able to give them a picture of what that looked like um, i remember going to counseling and seeing my uh, psychologist and she initially you know six to eight weeks out picked up that i wasn't speaking uh, like uh, i was previously that i wasn't able to form and complete sentences and my thoughts were all over the place and then every once in a while she would remind me you know six weeks ago you weren't able to have this conversation or answer this question like that do you remember and i would say i don't remember but she would encourage me and tell me that it's definitely the case and then that would make me feel better and then that would 
allow me to celebrate that win and take a little bit of the load off. And I'd feel a little bit more encouraged to continue going after, you know, the recovery. Um, I, I, there's, there's two or three things you said there that are, that are, that are actually hu very important. And, um, I agree with completely. Um, the last thing that you're talking about is the recognition of progress. And I see this, I, I, I run a, a practice a couple of evenings a week, um, in my local town. And this is the thing that when patients come into me, they can never tell whether they've made progress for the most part, unless they've made huge progress. So I suppose the analogy here is, it's a bit like our kids, Bill. We never really see them getting tall in front of us because unless unless we measure, you know, their heights on the walls and have that famous uh, marks on the walls thing that goes on. Uh, because when, you know, granny who hasn't seen them for six months comes in, they say, oh my God, James and Alan got so tall, you know, and you were kind of going, did they? And of course, that's the reason, because it's, if it happens so slowly in front of you, you can't see it. And patients are the same. So if I have patients that have, you know, sore shoulders and, you know, they can only move their arm to here when they come to me, but they can move it to here the next day they come in, just to be able to prove to them that they can do that is almost like phenomenal. They just, as you say, you felt great when it was proven to you that you were, you were doing better. And what I was saying in the book was that in terms of a very simple thing to do, um, and I know that this uh, is a very, a lot of stroke survivors find this very difficult, but just to take a video, even, even you know, of walking up the corridor. So um, I've been working with a, a stroke family um, close to us over the last few months. And we actually did this at the start. We took the, you know, the, we took the walking and he was walking with a cane and you could see the kind of, as you say, the very slow walking and the steps were very small and there was, it wasn't a kind, it was kind of like a boom, boom, boom. There was no kind of um, continuity with it. And we used to take a video every two weeks of uh, the walking from, you know, more or less the same position up. And it was amazing just to see the difference and even show that to the stroke person themselves and you could just see the smile on their face you know they, it was just a realization that uh, it had changed so much from that and that was that was really such a, a such a brilliant thing and you see the other thing that you mentioned there which which i which i'm hugely interested in was the whole issue of you were talking about your caregiver your wife acknowledging what you were doing and kind of recording what you were doing and i think this is a very very important point because um, there's a psychologist in America, he's called Dan Areli, Areli, A-R-I-E-L-Y, and he's written a brilliant book called Predictably Irrational. And uh, one experiment that he does in it, if, if it's OK to mention it, is he does an experiment with Lego Bill. And what he does is he takes people, um, two groups of people, and he gives them the he's giving them sets of Lego that maybe takes them 10 minutes to to make. And he's paying them to do it. And what he's interested in is every time they do a Lego set, they come and get the next one. But he pays them a little bit less for the next one. And he pays less for the next one. And he wants to see at what point do people feel that it's not worth their while to keep going. However, there's a there's a there's a, a little um, trick to the, the experiment in that. When the when one group of people come up with their Lego set made and they come to the researcher, the researcher looks at the Lego set, they acknowledge it and they say, well done, that looks very good. And then they place it behind them in a place on a shelf where the person can see it. The second group, they come up. The researcher, they look, they don't say anything much, they kind of nod and then they break the Lego piece up and they put it in the Lego bin under the table and then they hand them the next set. They pay them for that one. And this is what goes on. And I suppose what what can you can imagine what would happen? The group that where their work was acknowledged and where their work was recorded and basically had something there visually to see where they had a bit of pride in what they were doing. They kept going for almost twice as long as the people where the work was not acknowledged, mm -hmm. where there was no record of it being done, even though they were being paid the same thing. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that 
this same thing happens in human nature in every aspect of life. I mean, I see it in my own work sometimes. You know, if, if somebody, a manager or somebody says to you, God, Ken, you're doing a great job, which doesn't cost anything. Uh, it's a huge motivation, keeps you going. Um, if you're a stroke survivor and somebody, you know, is acknowledging that you're, you know, Bill, you're doing fantastic work. Um, actually, you know, that we'll, we'll record how many repetitions you did today. We'll keep a log of it. We'll actually see that the log, you know, is is growing each day. Or if it's steps, we, we record the steps on our step counter or our Fitbit. And we have that. So we at least can look back and say that, look at a month ago, this is what we were doing. Look at the volume that you've done. Fair play to you. You've done really well. And a caregiver can have the... Like easily have the qualities to do that. And it's one of the things that they don't realize is so important uh, just to just to do that, record what people are doing, acknowledge what they're doing, praise them for it is like in the business world. We we do much more. We can do twice as long because we just that's the kind of motivation. And I, I think that's a very interesting uh, concept that Dan O'Reilly mentions. And I think I think we should be very cognizant of that. Um, and then the final thing that you mentioned just again with your walking was that I, I suppose over my 30 years, I kind of feel that, as I said to you earlier, there's there's probably 30 therapies that people can do. But I tr fully believe that it's the, the sequencing of therapies is actually an important thing that people don't think about. So if we have four or five therapies that I think you can do um during the day and of course uh, this is the beauty of being at home as well is that you know the night before we might have planned that you're going to start your therapy at 10 o'clock or 10 a.m but when you wake up in the morning and you feel very tired or extra fatigued because of whatever's going on in your life you can throw that out to 12 o'clock or one o'clock but um when you're in a rehab center you don't usually have that flexibility you know your therapist has your therapy scheduled at a certain time and if that suits the way you're feeling that day great and if it doesn't sometimes that maybe means you might miss out on your therapy on a particular day but i i would feel that um and i suppose i use this analogy of lights mirrors action a little bit to stand for the sequencing so i would feel that lights kind of really you know, is, is is standing for those therapies that kind of warm up or wake up your body. And I would include w walking as being one of the first things that should be done. So if if you can walk and if 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 you've been encouraged to uh, do walking and you you believe about walking and you know the benefits, then I would be saying to you, let walking be one of the first things you do each day, because it's kind of warming up your body and it's kind of, you know, getting that brain producing those growth factors and uh, hormones that are produced that probably allow you to benefit a little bit better later on. And um, I would feel that then after being warmed up, that if you're going to do some simple stretches for your limbs that, you know, keep the keep you from developing contractures. Um, and, you know, th there's some very simple stretches that can be done. And I, I mentioned some of those in one of the chapters as well. I would feel that's an, that the correct place to do that. And then after that, then we're into our therapies that can kind of excite the brain or, you know, energize the brain. And that's that's where what what I feel are the kind of mirror therapies or the sensory substitutions or the cross educations or those therapies that kind of um, potentially excite your brain and, and allow more neuroplasticity to, to potentially take place. And then after that, the normal things you do in your day you know, your normal functional activities that you would do around the house, like lifting things, you know, cutting things, opening jars, all those things. I feel then that you have a better chance that when you do those, you, because you've kind of set the environment in your brain to be, you know, you know, energized and um, kind of excited. I think that there's a better chance that you will recover or create new pathways because of that. So I, I would feel that sequencing is quite an important thing as well. So I don't know how you feel about that. You know, I'd agree with that and flexibility, especially uh, in your timeline and your schedule, because if you wake up in the morning and you're feeling terrible, um, then nothing's getting done. Nothing's getting done. Really. I still experience that sometimes, you know, and I'm 12 years out. So I wake up in the morning. If I've had a bad night's sleep, there is nothing getting done in the morning. It doesn't matter how um, motivated I want to be, or I think I am. It's just not getting done. And the best thing to do, the safest thing to do is to do nothing and then allow myself to slowly warm up, 
wake up, whatever the word is that I need to, um, to get to that particular day. And then after that, I can definitely consider doing that particular exercise. Or sometimes I wake up in the morning at six and I feel like I need to go to the gym and I'll wake up in the morning and I'll go to the gym uh, at six in the morning. Like sometimes I will not get there for the whole week because I just cannot get my head around getting there. And, you know, that going to the gym and not feeling good about my body means that I don't put a good exercise, uh, a good effort in into uh, the weightlifting and perhaps my form is out. That could risk injuring me or pulling a muscle or, you know, causing more long-term damage. So the flexibility and not being hard on myself for not doing the gym today that's really important as well. So waking up in the morning and deciding I've got 25 emails to answer and then being really upset with myself that I can't answer them doesn't also help. So it's like very important to be able to be flexible and to not give yourself a hard time, to give yourself a break and to say, look, okay, we're having a rough day. Today's not the day. Let's fight the battles we can fight when we can fight them and it kind of puts you in a sense of more of a, a sense of control right not that we're in control of anything really but in the sense of like i'm going to go with the flow and when you're in flow with your particular mood or your energy levels or experience when your head is on board at the same rate as your body then you can just get through it and i feel like the healing time decreases as well like that recovery from that terrible night's sleep decreases if i'm exerting energy in being hard on myself and giving myself a hard time as well as being low on energy when i wake up it's just going to make the day worse and it's going to get things um, happening worse you know i might take it out on my wife or i might interact badly with one of the kids and it's all things that i don't want to be doing um so that's i've, I've become really good at trying to go with the flow and try to be flexible with my timeline so that um, nobody's expecting me to respond to an email because I haven't set an expectation that as soon as you send the email, I will definitely answer it within three minutes. You know, nobody is expecting that type of a response from me. So I can look at the list of 25 and I can get to them in my own time. And I might feel good about the fact that I answered three of them or four of them today and the others go in the to-do list for tomorrow. And if I wake up in the morning feeling great, well, then I'll, I'll go through a few more and send them out. Um, the, the, the things that you're suggesting are very common sense uh, things there. It doesn't sound like you've rewritten anything um, or created anything spectacularly new. And that's what I like about your book. It is back to basics. It's just standard stuff that all people may um, already have known that they've forgotten about or they're not completely um, uh, they're distracted by other things so they just haven't come back to those standard uh, simple things and that's what I like about your book it's very um, it, it, it's not very scientific from the point of view or we're not reading literature uh, pieces there that are about you know uh, the studies and the research and the data, we're just actually taking examples, you're applying it to common day, everyday life, and people can definitely benefit from it. Caregivers, most importantly, can definitely benefit from it in that time where maybe the person who you're caring for is resting, or they're not in your care for the moment, or you've got some time to yourself, you can read it. And as a result of that, you can make your your role as a caregiver a little easier i feel yeah well look at when i was when i started writing the book um i was working with three stroke survivors and their families in uh, uh very closely in particular i was i was obviously you know i'd heard and interviewed lots of stroke survivors hundreds over the the few years beforehand but what i was hearing was that it was very important to write the information in a very easy to understand way because you know if it's if it was a caregiver then they don't have a health you know they didn't have a health background or healthcare background then you had to try and write it in some way that it was very easy to understand and actually to be honest I've I've um even my wife Maria 
I she didn't read the book or, until relatively recently. And actually, she said to me that she was almost a little bit afraid to read it because she thought that she wouldn't understand it because it was she was expecting it to be a lot of medical jargon and a medical terms, as you just said. Uh, but actually, she 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 enjoyed it because she said it was all, it was just very simple. But but just to say to people that there's there's about 140 footnotes of evidence that you know goes along with the the information so if you want the evidence if you're a healthcare professional and you're reading it you know you'll it'll direct you to where the evidence is and it's that's a good thing yeah. yes exactly it's evidence based but it's not a it's not a academic uh no piece it, of it was writing. Like, I, no and i set out and i and also too i i felt from looking at an awful lot of stroke books uh, that I had read, obviously, when I was researching, that a lot of stroke books try to do, in my mind, a little bit too much because they try to tell you everything about stroke. They try to do the medical side of things and describing, you know, the different types of strokes and the medication for strokes yeah. and all those things. And I kind of felt that, you know, I don't want it. I don't want that part. Uh, you know, we're going straight in here into it's a week from your discharge home. You are going to feel uh you're you're not looking forward to this because you're going to be disappointed and i want you to, somebody to give you this book and read it or you give it to your caregiver who's also going to be um stressing because they're not looking forward and it to give you confidence it give you kind of a going oh my god like these are the things that go on uh, if i explain this to my stroke survivor that hopefully will motivate them that you know when they get home there there is a program um and then i wanted to kind of have a definite, you know, I'm not saying that the program I've laid out is the absolute recipe because it isn't the recipe, mm -hmm. but it's a recipe that can be tried and it'll get people going and it will give them a, a sensible one to try and do. Um, now, and it's lovely for you to say to me that, you know, it kind of sounds like we're taking common sense things and we're just re repackaging them a little bit. And that's that's exactly what we do a lot of times. I mean, a lot of, you know, famous therapies and things, uh, I often say the likes of Pilates and things like this. Pilates is a is a hugely successful therapy that talks about, you know, doing core exercises. But when you break it down, Pilates is very simply simple strengthening exercises and sometimes simple, you know, stretching and things that incorporate it. And but it becomes important because there's a, a you know, there's a there's a, um, a whole life around of that and people become to love it and um, it becomes popular. But essentially, when you know, but love it down um, we haven't they haven't created anything really too new. It's just how the different simple exercises are arranged into a program that works for people. Yeah. Now, uh, what what? What is discussed in my book is are some innovative terms. I suppose I use the opportunity to actually introduce three different types of therapy that maybe people mightn't be so uh, familiar with, because this was the focus of my research group. Um, and those therapies were number one, mirror therapy, which which a lot of people are used to. But actually, I'm quite surprised because I I, I, I spoke to a stroke family in Canada only recently, and they had never heard of mirror therapy. I was very surprised at that. Mm. Um, cross did education. A, did that person have a deficit in one of their arms? It was, they did. It, well, it was, it was actually the son of the family that um, had had the stroke and, and actually they had, um, they had been to lots of different, ther you know, different places looking for kind of solutions, uh, but they never heard of mirror therapy, which I was surprised about. And um, I don't know if this is, 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 is common. It was only a snapshot, but when you're involved in these therapies, you always assume that everybody knows about them. Isn't that right? Uh, so Indeed. to hear that somebody didn't didn't know about it was that's that that was reassuring for me that it was good then to be talking about it. Mm. The second thing we talk about is um, the whole idea of sensory substitution, um, and this is this is a very interesting area. Um, is it okay to talk about it a little bit, uh, Bill? It is because a bit I've, I've delved a little bit into sensory substitution, and I interviewed for episode two hundred. I interviewed Cheryl Schiltz, who was a lady who. Uh, was one of the first people to substitute her inner ear and her balance with her tongue. Yes. 
and that work was done by Paul Bucky Reader and his team, um, some uh, researchers from Massachusetts, uh, from the university somewhere in Wisconsin, Madison, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, or whatever, <laughs> whichever way around it goes. Um, and uh, Cheryl is like patient number one in this particular field in that when she was able to reestablish her balance by training her tongue to take over the role of her damaged inner ear, um, it opened a whole world of possibility for people uh, with all sorts of issues. So I'd love to hear about your uh, your thoughts Excuse on me? sensory substitution. Well, it's I mean, it's brilliant. I, I just like yourself, um, when I read Norman Doidge's The Brain That Changes Itself, and I read that chapter about um, Cheryl, and they were termed wobblers. So essentially, when when women who were pregnant um, were put on an antibiotic afterwards, if they needed it, um, they used an antibiotic called gentamicin. And if you were on it for far too long, uh, it had destroyed the vestibular apparatus in your ears which is your balance mechanism. Uh, so these people's lives were ruined. Um, and she probably would have told you all that experience. Mm -hmm. And then Paul Bakurita developed this very novel idea that could you, could you, if the information from the ears wasn't, you know, working correctly and going up to your brain and telling your brain how to control your balance, could other information be substituted um, from it? And of course, what he did was he created a like a piece of chewing gum or a piece of plastic with sensors on it that go on the tongue, as you've mentioned. And they were attached to like a Bob the Builder helmet. So when the person, when she went forward and backwards, a certain array of sensors were stimulated. And then when she went uh, side to side, a uh, different array and when side, you know, and and the what's what what was brilliant is your tongue is so sensitive here that the brain was was able to figure out, the brain figures out essentially those three different mess messages. And it was actually able to kind of reestablish an ability to control balance, which is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> when I read that, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I actually had a PhD student that was just starting off with me. And we thought, I thought we'll get involved in this area. I think this is great. This is great potential. And, uh, we actually contacted an entrepreneur in London, I think, um, who had actually uh, started off uh, with the intention of setting up a huge business around creating tongue stimulators because the whole science sounded interesting. And uh, he was a very interesting character, uh, but his the interesting uh, became uh, not so interesting when he wanted about $15,000 from us to get us involved in the research and essentially uh, do research that would have helped um, him to promote this. So we figured this wasn't going to be possible. We didn't have the money and also it didn't make sense to uh, help help do the research in that area. So what we started doing was we, uh, my PhD student uh, started investigating, were there other senses um, that could also be used instead? And what he found, what Peter Lynch found was, and we've published a number of papers on this, some systematic reviews, which is very good um, evidence. He found that uh, tactile sense or touch sense or vibration sense um, is one sensation that has potential to substitute um, for missing information. The other was um, hearing or auditory information. So what we set about doing was, um, and again, the, the idea of sensory substitution is very much that if, you know, if you have a stroke and you've had your arm and uh, disability, the normal information that should go every day and every moment up to your brain is not going in that fashion. So could we substitute something else? And what we've been working on in our lab um, is we created a device that, you know, if we if we if we use um, if, if a patient holds um, a sensor that gives a vibration um, or they 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 and they hear a sound while they're trying to stand um, and re relearn how to take weight on their legs uh, so that if they take a lot of weight, they they feel uh, they get a very big sensation and um, hear a big sound if they um, take very little weight they 
you know, get a small sensation and very small sounds. And then there's that sweet spot that, you know, the, the correct weight. Uh, we find that um, patients in our trials are doing really, really well with this. They find that this is the brain is essentially figuring it out. Um, and my analogy of this here is very much you see the glasses that I've on. Um, I don't know. Do you wear glasses, Bill? But I I wear uh, what's called very focal glasses. So um, these glasses have three different types of lenses in them. Uh, so the bottom lens is for when I'm reading and the middle is for when I'm looking at television and the top for when I'm driving. And when I got these at the start, I actually I, 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 I was so disappointed because I thought to myself, my optician has definitely got the prescription wrong here because I can't I can't use them. It's it was ridiculous. And but after about almost a week, something clicked and they were perfect. And I, I understand now what's happening is that our brain, my brain has to figure out very subtly how to tilt my head so that when I look at a book, the tilt happens at the right time. When I look at the television, a different tilt happens. And when I'm driving, a different tilt happens. And essentially, the brain figures it out. And that's was the, that's that's the principle or the concept behind sensory substitution, that if you can input more different information into your brain while you're doing a similar task, it's possible for the brain to figure it out. And in 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 my book, I wanted to try and come up with, you know, a cost effective or, or some version of this um, that patients could try at home in their own homes. And what I did was um, I, I've given the example of a digital weighing scales that people can use a bit like what I was discussing earlier that, you know, you can you, you can kind of practice taking weight using this and making a small little platform for yourself. And and again, it's it's just a cost effective way of using a kind of a, an innovative therapy that that has huge potential down the line um, for rehab centers. But it's a version that you can use at home yourself. So I don't know how does that sound to you? That sounds fantastic. I mean, I love the idea that somebody's actually working in that space and doing the research in that space. Because let's face it, I mean, most of the people who uh, deal with stroke survivors, they get them to the point of this is the best that we can do. The co the uh, allocation of rehabilitation is over. The insurance company won't fund it anymore. And then they'll send that person home. And then the task is up to the caregiver and the stroke survivor to do the rest of the work to get their um, uh, leg working better or or doing more or or um, whatever that is. And that could be a big setback. And like you said, some people will leave hospital, they'll come home, they'll feel better about that. But some will leave hospital or their rehabilitation, they'll come home and they'll feel worse about that because they feel like they didn't get enough rehabilitation. So any tool that can do, um, that can support somebody to, uh, get additional movement in their leg is fantastic or in their arm. And I love the idea of connecting that to a sound and then also to a, a physical stimulation, uh, stimulus, like a vibration. And um, that teaches the, the brain, the difference in the, in where the leg is in the world, because that's what I had an issue with. I had an issue with neuro, with uh, proprioception. So my leg didn't know where it was in the world. So when I was first learning how to walk, I would stand very heavily. I would land very heavily on my leg and jar my whole leg all the way up and down, up, up to my hip. And it wasn't pleasant. And then some days I'd be standing uh, still at the bench, at the kitchen, uh, making a cup of tea or something. And then because I um, wasn't moving my leg or it wasn't in the right position, my knee would just collapse and I would trip over and I would fall. Uh, so any additional information that my leg had, had to come from learning the hard way, it had to come from either jarring and and putting my knee in the wrong position or dropping that knee and tripping over. And that is a way of learning, but it's probably not the ideal way of learning. Um, yeah. So yeah, I love that work. I do hope that you guys uh, get some results um, that you can work with and you can develop something that uh, is going to make a difference. It is. And um, I suppose, look at behind all of this is um, 
a full re you know research lab that's working to try and um, develop you know systems that allow patients to do therapy in their own home and maybe be monitored remotely and and that's kind of the on one side of 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 what i'm interested in but the book was was the idea was could you develop something that is you know that you don't have to buy fancy equipment for you don't have to outlay a lot of money um and so those three therapies that i discuss you know mainly because they're they're very innovative things and they're very exciting the potential of them but you know mirror therapy you can buy a 10 to 15 dollar mirror and you can place it on your table and you can get huge benefits from you know in your arms and in your legs and again uh, some people use that and they find it phenomenal and some people also then use it and they don't like the concept of it at all and that's the way that it should be done you should try these things um and you get your gut feeling whether they they're, they're for you or not for you um the the concept of cross education of strengthening and i i know there's a lot of um there's a lot of people in one way or a wee bit of a wee bit nervous about this concept but it's the idea that um if if you go to the gym bill for six weeks and you just strengthen your good side your non-affected side for six weeks um if you measure the strength on that side after six weeks naturally it's going to be much stronger but amazingly if you measure the other side it could be potentially 30 40 percent stronger even though you've never done anything and, and that's another phenomenal um, concept as well. Um, and it's because there's an overload of um, electricity that goes between the two sides of the brain. Um, so it's more of a neural effect. But, it, but it's a very definitely evidenced uh, thing that could work. And what we were working on in our lab was the idea that we might do mirror therapy and strengthening exercises at the same time. So we were combining both of those two things. But, but for... For a practical point of view, a person can buy a, a resistance band for less than ten dollars um, or ten euros, and in their own home they can, you know, attach that resistance band to a door handle. Or there's a very simple way of doing it with a knot, and they can do exercises on their good side. Um, as long as people realize, I'm I'm not advocating that that's what you would do all the time, but. Mm. If you do that for 10 or 15 minutes as a little package during the day, then you potentially can benefit from that cross education effect. Of course, go, you have to do all the other things and there's nobody suggesting that you would ignore the, you know, the affected side. I think people get a bit nervous because they feel that maybe I, maybe there's a suggestion that we would just focus on the um, the non affected side and that wouldn't make sense whatsoever. But I think during a day in your home that there's a place for you to kind of strengthen the good side of your body to try and benefit from those cross education effects. And I, I would feel that that type of therapy is 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 what we were saying there. It's, you know, after you're walking and you're stretching that you're kind of doing one of these things to activate or energize your brain. I feel that that fits in there and definitely it's worth the trying for people. And again, very cost effective and a very simple and can be built into a program very easily. And some of the patients that I've used this with absolutely love it. They find it very easy to carry out and you know they feel like they are strengthening and all strengthening and all exercise is beneficial regardless uh, and some others don't take to it as much but it, it's good to have the choice you know and um, so those are the three things that i suppose we've spent a lot of time really researching very very um deeply in our in our research lab and then i'm, I'm bringing those then into a kind of a cost effective very practical way that they can be done um in the book but more importantly explaining to people about them and explaining to them in a simple to understand way so that you know again if your wife um was back in those days when you came home that you know she might say to you bill you know there's a thing called you know mirror therapy and i'm i'm just going to explain to you in a very easy to understand way how it's supposed to work and you know what happens in your brain supposedly um that makes you a better chance of a recovery and maybe we'll we'll spend ten dollars and we'll buy one and maybe maybe we'll give it a go. And you see, one of the things that um I've done with the book, and I hopefully this is successful, is that I wanted to try and merge the book with some digital information or extra resources. 
So what I've done um, at the end of every chapter, I don't know, you see, when I, I probably sent you an advanced copy of the book, Dip Bill, so you wouldn't have noticed this. They were there. The, I, the QR codes were there. Oh, were they? Yes. So you can see that at the end of the chapter, uh, there's a QR code. And if you if you scan your phone over that, that then brings you to my website and to a resource where there's there's YouTube videos that describe how to do the exercises. There's YouTube videos that discuss in very easy to understand a way, a summary of what's in the chapters as well. And actually, um, recently, um, a friend of mine, um, his family had a stroke. And actually, I, it was the first time I actually saw this working um, that I was showing them the book and uh, the the caregiver was reading it. And when I gave it to the stroke person, um, I hadn't realized that their their eyesight or their their the visual thing was a bit difficult. So they, they actually weren't able to read it. And it was it was actually brilliant then to just put on the videos uh, which described what I was doing and they, they loved it. So um, I suppose another version would be to to to. Uh, uh, to record an audio version of the book and maybe we'll do that at some stage but i i've kind of tried to bring in these uh, extra resources and and hopefully that will build as time goes on because i've set it up so that more more worksheets or more um, documents can be attached uh, so that we're you're hopefully we're giving a little bit of extra value you know for 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 what you're getting um, i love it i absolutely oh, love you. it as we uh, wrap <laughs> up can you just Give us a brief uh, website. Tell, tell people where they can find it, where they can buy the book. Of course, we're going to use all the links in the show notes. So people who are listening, uh, who want to go and check it out, um, they can go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes and we'll have the show notes there with all the links. But um, Ken, can you just tell people where they can go and find the book? Yes. Yeah, so since last, so I'm, my publishers are called Book Launchers in America, and the book was um, it was put up on Amazon, um, all Amazon sites uh, from last Thursday. Now there's a little bit uh, so the probably your your um, your most of your audience will be this side of the world. So there's obviously Amazon dot um, AU is it or dot or dot com. Most of my audience is in the US actually. They'd be dot com but dot AU. But I I know. Oh yes. I know from experience. Uh, whenever somebody is in their country, if they just put Amazon in the search engine. Their particular oh, yeah. home, Amazon, comes up, and then you can do a search like that. Yeah, and there's um. So if it's Amazon.com, then um, essentially just go to Amazon and um, put in Lights, Mirrors, Action, and the book will come up. There's three versions of the book. Uh, there's an ebook. Um, there's the paperback that I just put up in front of you, and then there's a hardback cover over it, and um. Yeah, the easiest thing then is just to buy it through Amazon. Now, it's also available through all larger bookstores as well, but most of them will probably need you to order the book and then they'll get it in for you. But I think Amazon is probably the easiest thing to do because um, I know here, you know, most people will have Prime and it probably doesn't cost anything for delivery and things like that. Um, my, I, my own website is um, www.lightsmirrorsaction.com and there you'll find also information about the book and extra resources and things. Dr. Kenneth Monaghan, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I really appreciate <laughs> our conversation and you reaching out. Um, I think your work is fantastic and um, I know it's going to make a difference to a lot of people. Thank you once again for joining us on today's episode. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Monaghan and found our discussion on stroke recovery and innovative therapies enlightening. If you're interested in my book about stroke recovery, you can get your copy on Amazon by uh, entering my name, Bill Gassiamas, or by visiting recoveryafterstroke.com slash book. To learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and to download a full interview transcript, head over to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. A massive heartfelt thanks to everyone who has left a review, whether it's for the book or for the podcast. 
It means a lot to me. Reviews are essential for the success of the podcast and your feedback helps others discover this valuable content, making their stroke recovery journey a little bit easier. If you haven't left a review yet, please consider leaving a five-star review and sharing what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, remember to leave a comment below the episode, like the episode and subscribe to the show on your preferred platform to get notifications of future episodes. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share, now is the perfect time to join me on the show. The interviews are unscripted and require no preparation. Just be yourself and share your experience to help others in similar situations. If you have a commercial product that supports stroke survivors in their recovery, you can join me on a sponsored episode of the show. Simply visit recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the form, and I'll get back to you with details on how we can connect via Zoom. Thanks again for being here and listening. I truly appreciate your support. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.